I speak to the son of the legendary diplomat, National Security Advisor Brzezinski. Why have U.S.-China ties stalled since his father's generation? Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside with me, Tianwei, a program coming to you live from Beijing. They say, like father, like son. That Asian wisdom at least could apply to this father and this son. The big name Brzezinski, the father, and Mark Brzezinski, the son. The father was counselor to the Lyndon Johnson administration and national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter. He was instrumental in laying the foundation to the budding U.S.-China relationship. The son, Mark Brzezinski, former U.S. ambassador to Sweden, inherited his father's fascination about the world, and he is most keen on the fate of U.S.-China relations. On the sidelines of the just-concluded China Development Forum held in Beijing, I spoke to Ambassador Brzezinski. Our conversation began at the Diao Yutai guest house, the very same guest house that hosted his father during those important visits to China many years ago. Take a look. Diao Yutai State Guest House, that's where your father once wore. Yes. I'm sure you heard a lot from him, the stories decades ago about U.S. and China. I did. I'm sure those stories will be even more meaningful today. Well, it's so great that you start this interview that way, because for the last couple of days, I really felt I was channeling my late father, because he believed so much in the Sino-U.S. relationship as having the potential to address some of the world's great challenges of today mm -hmm. and tomorrow. He really felt that this is the most important relationship America has with the world. If he were still alive today, what he would be doing is he would be on American television using his credibility and his legitimacy as a statesman, as someone who had produced for the American people in foreign policy, he would be explaining to the American people mm. how, how the Sino-U.S. relationship benefits them. And he would be coming to China to meet with the Chinese leadership and to say, it takes two to tango. Mm. Both sides have to constructively engage each other. Both sides bring good aspects and things that need to be improved. Do we still have statesmen like this? That's an excellent question. The American political context has changed since the time of the Cold War. During the Cold War, who led American foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Kissinger, Brzezinski, Scowcroft, mm -hmm. Albright, people who were true foreign policy scholars and who had steeped their knowledge in foreign policy from the very beginning to the very end. Right. They weren't part-time foreign policy guys who joined a presidential administration because they'd helped the president campaign. These were America's and the world's best experts on the foreign policy challenges America mm. faced around the world. Mm. Since the Cold War, the primacy of expertise in American foreign policy has been replaced by other priorities right. in the American political game. What counts in American politics today? Is it expertise? It really, it's more about votes and more about money. That's the American political game. And as a result, you get what you ask for. Yeah. When you elect a president today, there's a lot of political people, not foreign policy specialists, but political people who want jobs in government. The foreign policy jobs are very attractive. They want the foreign policy jobs, yes. but they don't bring the expertise. As a result of that, how do you see the potential between China and the United States. Now, Ambassador Brzezinski, you know better than I do that what's going on right now on the trade is only a portion of the U.S.-China relations. That's right, yeah. The real picture is much bigger than that. Well, let's talk about both sides because I think that's an important point. Mm. First of all, let's not minimize the trade differences. The trade differences are important for a key constituency a key beneficiary of this relationship, mm -hmm. the business community in both countries and also in other countries. Don't forget about that. Right. And 
all of them want this to be solved and all of them want America and China to operate within a rules-based system. And I'm actually confident that this will be resolved because I believe that, that the Chinese have been clear that they understand that there are some problems that need to be fixed and I think that that's a very constructive way to mm -hmm. engage. My worry is a little bit more about the American side mm. because I don't believe the demonization of China is just about trade. Mm. I think that there is a demographic of policy people, security people, military people, political people who for decades have been hoping to break the catalyst of the American-Chinese relationship and their time has come. They have been empowered by the current moment and if President Trump left office today, they wouldn't leave. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't want to give up the ground that they fought for. And so I'm worried. What does it take to break this almost predictable trend, as you just said, that even though the administration could have gone, but some of the quote-unquote legacies of the administration and the hardliners against China and against the potential of relationship to begin with are still going to be in the system. Sure. Well, there are also beneficiaries of the relationship. The American business community clearly benefits from a constructive, normalized Sino-US relationship. When I was the United States ambassador in Sweden, Sweet the Swedish government undertook an effort that was very interesting. They pulled together a document that was very digestible, very understandable for the American people mm -hmm. that analyzed state by state by state how many American jobs and in what sectors are based in that particular state on, on Swedish investment in, mm. say, Virginia or Pennsylvania or New York or whatever, all 50 states. And they shared those, the, the, that with the business people in that state, the state governors who want to attract overseas investment, who then distributed it right. and so forth and so on. That's the kind of knowledge dissemination that needs to occur about the American-Chinese relationship. Mm. Um, and then there's the Chinese side. Um, the, the, my father and President Xi had a very good, close, personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And when my father died, President Xi wrote my mother a personally very meaningful letter that she received. And we treasure that and we thank President Xi mm. for that. We very much uh, respect the fact that he's been part and a central piece of the American-Chinese relationship. It is important to accentuate in Chinese policy making that the success of both sides is part of the relationship. Mm. Because there are some in China who see China's long-term rise. There are some in China who see America's long-term decline. And there are some who actually celebrate that. That's no way to have a constructive relationship. If I want you to fail, we're not gonna have a friendship. If I want you to succeed, it's more likely we'll have a friendship. Mm. So how do you read, given the current realities in both countries, about the eagerness to develop better relations? Well, I think that's based on self-interest. Um, and I think that it's, it, it will become clear mm. as that self-interest is harmed by a breakdown of the relationship that those who are losing the benefits of the relationship will speak out. You mean we have to hurt more in order to know the real nature of the well, issue? Well, I, ho I hope it doesn't come to that. But probably that's something we have to face. I think that we don't want the relationship to break down. If the relationship is based on preventing failure, it's not as strong as a relationship on mutual success. Mm. But it's important for the Americans to understand that China's success is a great story for the world's humanity. And that's something that I really want to emphasize. You know. The way people in one country mm. perceive another country is not based on a study of data and statistics and, and facts. Mm. For regular people, that's not how they develop a, their perception of, say, China or Sweden or Germany. It's based on human interest stories. That's right. It's based on narratives. And the narrative of China over the last 40 years going from a country that I visited in 1981, think about that, Chengdu, for example, which only had dirt roads and used army vehicles, 
on the streets to the tech city of the future that mm -hmm. Chengdu now. That is a great rags to riches story that I think Americans would mm -hmm. really respect and embrace because it's quite frankly universal and transferable to the American narrative as well. Indeed, a very important story to tell. China-U.S. ties are in need of patching up. We all know that. Well, Mark Brzezinski has described the importance of savvy diplomat in a time of partisan politics and policy by tweet. Where can we find such professionals? Mark hints that in addition to perseverance, sometimes foreign policy could also be a family business. Take a listen. Ambassador Brzezinski, you grew up in a family in which big matters seem to be, can be discussed around the dinner table. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. I just wonder, what was it like to be in a family of the Brzezinskis? It was the privilege of a lifetime because we were just my brother, my sister, yes. uh, and I. And my sister is one of America's most popular television talk show sure. hosts. And I think she would share this with you. When we were seven, eight, nine years old, my father at the dinner table or lunch table would be asking us about detente, salt <laughs> too, the Middle East peace process, <laughs> U.S.-China relations. Quite an appetizer. Yes, exa exactly. Uh, I'm surprised we didn't run away from home. <laughs> but the point How did you manage to do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the point is, is that my father, as a Washington leader, included his family in his life and that was a great gift because not every Washington leader includes their family in their life. So just as stupid kids, we were brought to dinners with Deng Xiaoping and mm. Mrs. Deng. Did you still remember anything about it? I I absolutely, you were very, very young. I absolutely remember it. Tell me more and about it, that. It was very human. What do I mean by that? A dinner in your home being put on by the premier of China. Your street is closed off by the Secret Service. There are helicopters overhead, <laughs> shining lights. The Secret Service says, two minutes out, Deng Xiaoping, Mrs. Deng are arriving in a long motorcade with police cars. And what happens in our house? My parents light the fireplace, and the smoke comes pouring out because they hadn't opened the flue. <laughs> and so you know this story. They had to shut off that room right. and hold the meeting with Deng Xiaoping in the front hallway. And that's a, I want to emphasize that. Mm. Because in families, not everything is perfect. Mm. And you've got to just... Usually, a lot of things are not perfect. Exactly. <laughs> and so you just deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what we did was that we had that meeting there. My sister spilled caviar on Deng Xiaoping. Um, and, um, but he included us. And, and he included us in things around the world. I mean, my, my sister traveled with my father to the Middle East and met Yasser Arafat. Mm. I traveled with my father throughout Europe and to Asia. Mm. Uh, all of us came to retrace um, Mao Zedong's long march. But you know, for the common folks these days, yeah. when the media is pretty much portraying things from one perspective or not, what is the way for common people you know, to be more sophisticated about what they're seeing? The great Czech author wrote, for every language you know, another life you live. And I think that's true. Americans and Chinese should learn foreign languages. Because by learning foreign languages, you absorb consciously and subconsciously right. what's going on with them. And I go back to my late father, who spoke five languages, and until his dying days, would translate from Russian or Polish or French mm -hmm. from newspapers so that he would have a feel for what is going on in Europe mm -hmm. or in Russia. He did, he, and, and that's important because it goes back to your initial question about foreign policy expertise. Right. Because if you're uninformed, if you're told black is white, you'll believe it because that's what you've been told. And foreign policy professionals need to be that professional. And that is learned about this and not just going on gut. Mm -hmm. Um, and so sending out a tweet saying who is a bigger enemy, President Xi or the, the head of the Fed, Jay Powell, I don't consider to be professional. Um, I think that that's destructive and insulting, and um, I don't like it. Before we go, Ambassador Brzezinski, you're coming from a very well-known family. Yes. 
your father fought his way to be where he was, absolutely through his personal fight in a way and efforts. What, what kinds of you know, inspiration you get from your family, while at the same time, what kind of individual life you need to have of your own, apart or in addition to the family tradition? No, my father was not born into money or power. He was cast on America's by shores by World War II, mm -hmm. so was an immigrant to America through Canada. And many people don't know this, but he had polio when he was little, mm -hmm. and so wore leg braces when he was very young. So was he uh, one of the chosen ones to take leadership? No, he wasn't. You said it. He had to fight for it, and he faced setbacks mm -hmm. in his life. And there were times in my life when he shared stories that were meant to educate me. Mm -hmm. um, when I've had disappointments in my life, he said to me, Mark, learn from me. Make this a disappointment, not a defeat. Hmm. And he shared with me the story that when he was a professor at Harvard, the most popular professor, giving lectures that would have audiences clap for him standing, he was then denied tenure when he and my mother expected to stay in Boston mm -hmm. as an academic family for the rest of their life. But instead they said, I'm not going to make a defeat which brings me down and keeps me mm -hmm. down, but a disappointment that I learn from and grow from. And he went to New York, but set his sights on Washington. And he said, how do I use Columbia University in New York, but also relationships in Wall Street to get to Washington? And he built a relationship with David Rockefeller, mm -hmm. and he and David Rockefeller set up the Trilateral Commission, which became the most influential organization in international affairs, and he invited then Governor Carter to join the organization, and the rest is history. He was a Polish immigrant to America, mm. standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviets. That is what I learned. Mm. And so I know exactly what you're asking. There are good points, and there are some difficult points but the good outweighs the different because of things like that. Mr. Ambassador, what a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure is mine. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for your Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Ambassador Mark Brutginski telling us about his family stories and the families and the U.S. ties with China over the past decades. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CTTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tianwei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights across China and China.